everyone. Welcome to Booking It, a monthly podcast brought to you by the Clarington Public Library. My name is Emma. And I'm Jen. And we're back this month with a special episode highlighting one title that's been really popular for the past two years. Uh, But first, I wanted to check in with Jen about her graphic novel experience from last month. So if you missed that episode, Jen had never read a graphic novel before, and I'm somewhat of a graphic novel fan, so I gave her two recommendations, and she chose one, which I believe was Through the Woods. Yes. So how did you get on with it? I enjoyed it. I've never read a graphic novel before, and I read the whole thing. It didn't take very long to read because, like, there's not very many words, and I tried to follow along with the pictures, but I did really enjoy it. So this is the book that I read. But what I what I really liked about the book was I really liked the author or the illustrator's use of colors, specifically the first book or the first first short story. This is the um, the pictures, and I really liked the white and the red and the black, and I liked how the um, the characters you can't really see their faces, and you can't really see this character at all, but you kind of know what's happening, and when you're following along. This is the character that the girls are afraid of. And um, I, I enjoyed it. They're very quick reads. So if you don't have much time, graphic novels are definitely the way to go. Um, what else have I said? I noticed graphic novels are very popular with young adults and kids. So I just really wanted to see what it was all about. And I did enjoy it. And I could see where people that really don't like to read long novels would want to read a graphic novel because they're short, they're quick, you get the the gist of the story very quickly. Um, And I also like that now that I've read a graphic novel, I have more confidence in picking graphic novels for people because I can ask them what they like and then I might be able to figure out what, what I can pick for them. Because I didn't really know anything about graphic novels. And now that I read one, I kind of understand them a little bit more. Yeah. With graphics, like there's the more you read, the more you realize there's a lot of different like ways that the author will um, use like color or shape or like the visuals to help tell the story. So definitely a good experience. That is true. And I've watched The Walking Dead. And I know I know we have The Walking Dead graphic novels out at the Bowmanville branch so I think I might actually take out those and see how they follow along with the tv series yeah so the graphics I think from what I've heard I haven't read them but they they the tv show follows them to a point and they diverge wildly so that'll be an exciting um experience for you yeah so I'll take out the first one and I'll see how I like it yeah I'll see how it follows along with the the show and yeah The other thing with graphics is they're more of a medium than a genre. So what I mean by that is most people will like books and movies, right? And you'll have a lot of crossover between the book genres that you enjoy and the movie genres that you enjoy. So if you like romance books per se, uh, you'll probably enjoy romance movies. And then you're probably also likely to enjoy romance graphic novels. So there's a lot of different genres within graphics themselves. So if you've never tried a graphic before and you want to give it a shot, you know, come in and ask us and we'll probably ask you what you like about books and we'll be able to find something similar in the graphic novels. So yeah, if this is a piqued your interest, come by and we'll give you a recommendation. That is true. And like I said, they're very quick. So you could read a graphic in like, say, less than an hour, whereas a novel would take you many hours. Some people would take them many months to read. I know. I'm one of those people. (laughs) (laughs) So a quick warning before we continue the podcast that the book we're highlighting contains uh, discussions and descriptions of suicide and self-harm. So if you're uncomfortable or you're not in a place where you want to listen to that, feel free to skip out on this one. Um, so yeah, as we were saying, Jen and I were recommended the same title by a few of our coworkers. So we decided to both read it and give it a shot and do a bit of a comparison of our experiences to see what titles we came up with. Um, this book had a really long holds list when we read it. So if you're waiting for it, maybe there are some books here to tide you over, 
or if you've already read it and you want to move on to the next thing, maybe we'll have something for you. Did you want me to start or you want to start? Oh, you can start. I'll start. Cool. Um, so this was my sort of little brief description of the Midnight Library. So, Nora Seed feels as though her life is falling apart. Her morning starts with her neighbor finding her cat dead in the road, apparently struck by a car, and ends with Nora losing her longtime job at the music shop she works at, and has a sprinkling of encounters that serve to remind her how miserable her life, her life has become in between. Combined with her depression, it all becomes too much for her and she decides to end her life. However, Nora ends up somewhere she was never expecting. A mysterious library filled with endless shelves and a clock stuck perpetually just before midnight. There she finds her elementary school librarian, Mrs. Elm, who tells her that each book on the shelf is a potential life and represents a choice she could have made differently. Nora has the chance to answer all those nagging what-ifs that have fl floated through her head for so long. What if she never gave up swimming? What if she hadn't let her cat outside and had protected him better? What if she had pursued the dream career of her childhood? What if she followed her best friend to Australia? What if she had never quit her brother's band? Is there a perfect life waiting for her in the Midnight Library? So it explores a question that I think all of us have thought about in some way, shape, or form, where what if we had made a different decision in our past? Where would we be now? Would we be better off? Would we be worse off? Um, it's a really interesting take on this sort of question it has these elements of sci-fi um but it has like a fantasy feeling to it with the library itself but it then the explanation of it sort of involves a little bit of like multiple universe theory and quantum physics and things like that um it's a really interesting book i can see why it's been so popular um you really get a feel for who Nora is and how these kind of key events in her life have affected her through exploring other options she could have made, which is um, really interesting. Um, it's a really fun and fascinating concept to explore. So, Jen, what was your take on the Midnight Library? Well, that was a great synopsis, Emma. So, here is my take on the Midnight Library. So, here is the book, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. I will discuss elements of the book that I enjoyed without giving away too much information. So the book starts with the main character, Nora Seed, remembering different times in her life and wishing she could have made a different choice. She met up with a few pe people who reminded her that her life could be different. They made her feel horrible about the choices that she made and that it was, and that is when she decided her life was not worth living. So enter the Midnight Library, where Nora is able to relive certain times in her life that she thought she had made the wrong choice. She is able to see how her life could have been different. I like the setting and how much details went into each setting. Each character, or sorry, each chapter was about either Nora, the main character's time at the Midnight Library, or her reliving a time in her life when she thought she had made a wrong choice. The author writes in such a way you felt like you were sitting right there with Nora during her leaps. So one time when she was um, reliving, if she was going to, I think it was when she was a swimmer and she was doing a speech and she was so confused and she was staring at people and she just didn't know what to say. So I thought that that was really interesting. You felt kind of like you, like you were there with Nora and you felt kind of empathy for her, like, because she didn't really know what to do. I really... I really like the way that he described in detail how she felt. Um, I love the characters and, and how Nora's high school librarian, Mrs. Elm, who was part of her life when something devastating happened to her, was the person who was helping Nora in the Midnight Library. She was someone who Nora trusted and respected. So I thought the concept of the book was really interesting. Can you imagine if you could relive certain mistakes you made in your life? I found it fascinating that the author was able to change Nora's life story so many times as she was going through her book of regrets at the Midnight Library. She discovered who she could have been if she had made different choices. The author gives a whole new meaning to the word potential. Uh, Nora had to see her true potential to succeed and make the right choice for her life. We cannot live our life worrying about our regrets and how our choices affect other people. We need to find our own fulfillment with the choices we have made. I like the choice Nora made at the end of the book. 
It sums up the book nicely and makes Nora believe that she is important to so many people. This book would be an excellent choice for someone who has bouts of self-loathing or despair. You cannot change the past, so you need to live in the present and learn from your mistakes. Nora had a book of regrets, but her life and the people around her would have been different if she made different life choices. She learned in the Midnight Library that she was exactly where she needed to be. The people in her life were there for a reason. So I like the way that the author was able to um, bring the whole story together. And I don't know, I just thought it was a really interesting book. And it was a quick read for me. Like, I just wanted to know what was happening. And Yeah, it was like... You're, it kept you interested in what was going to happen next without being like um, like really plot driven like there's not a ton of there's a few twists and turns but it's not that sort of a book so it was really interesting that I felt that I couldn't put it down at spots you know what I mean yeah, yeah. Um, I can definitely see why it's been so popular if you haven't read the Midnight Library and that sounded good you can place a hold on our catalog I think we have it on ebook and um definitely on shelf jen's got one of them (laughs) um yeah so definitely check out the midnight library but in the meantime or if you already have here are a few recommendations to tide you over so um i identified like four main factors that i thought made this book really appealing So the first was the setting of the Midnight Library, the description of Mrs. Elm at her desk and the books on the shelves and how he goes into how they're different colors. Some of them are like a, they're all sort of a green color, I think. Um, And then, but some of them are a darker green or a lighter green. And then there's the Book of Regrets. Um, So it had that really strong setting component. Plus um, her lives, you get to feel a little bit of the different settings there. It takes you to a lot of different places that way. Um, Then there was the exploration of Nora as a character. So as we both said, you really get a feel for her and how her life sort of stacks up in different ways and what's important to her and what's not. Um, And then there's this sort of what if slash sci-fi or fantasy element. So exploring alternate choices. We sometimes call this um, sliding door fiction in the literary world. Um, So seeing how things would have played out if something was different. Um, And then what I think really kind of kept me going was um, the overall writing style, pace, and tone. Um, Matt Haig is really great at balancing all these different aspects he's got going on. So he's got the sci-fi element, Nora's element, and then like the setting element that he's all balancing. Um, But he doesn't, he typically doesn't spend too much, he doesn't, It doesn't get unbalanced. Everything is sort of nice and flowing and moves the story along. It'd be really easy, I think, to dwell on a particular life for too long and get into all the different details because he really does, it feels like he did a lot of research on um, this book in order to bring Nora's character together. But he doesn't do that. He lets it flow nicely from one chapter into the next. Sometimes, like, I don't know about you, Jen, but sometimes when authors kind of take this approach where things are broken up this way, I feel like, um, I feel frustrated when, like, you snap out of, like, a situation you're in. So, like, if a story has multiple characters, um, I'll just be, like, getting used to one character and then we'll snap back to another character. And I'm like, uh, (laughs) like. I definitely like the flow of this book. Yeah, the flow definitely really helps. It's really readable. Um. It's really great that way. So those are my four factors. And based on those four factors, I picked out three titles for you to try. So my first one is The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern. Hold it on this side so the camera can see it. It's got a beautiful cover, actually. All these keys, which are really important to the story. So this book is about Zachary Ezra Rawlings. He is a story-obsessed grad student. Whether it's video games, pulp fiction, he loves to study the makeup of stories. But one day, he discovers the most mysterious and enigmatic story of all time in a book in his university library of all places. This book contains many seemingly unrelated scraps of stories, but most intriguing of all of them is a story from his own past about finding a door as a child but choosing not to go through it. 
Zachary is not going to let adventure pass him up again, and he sets out to discover the truth behind this mystifying tome. His journey will take him to secret society masquerade balls, throughout subterranean library labyrinths, and across a starless sea. It's really highly atmospheric and richly detailed. Um, I've said before when talking to people that Aaron Morgenstern's writing is like candy for your brain. So you're reading this and she gives you all these like fantastically detailed settings. And then there's also this fantasy element layered on top of them. So the combination of that is just like, it's a, it makes the whole thing like really amazing to read if you're into settings. Um, it basically takes all these little different stories, myths, and fables contained in that book and lets them flow in and out of each other until you get this bigger narrative. Um, you sort of will pick up with one story and leave it for a while and then pick it up later on and then see how they all build up on top of each other. The plot is a little bit difficult to um, describe for this reason. So if you're really like plot driven, if you're really into like a linear narrative, where it's like this happens and then this happens and then this happens. This book probably isn't going to be for you. It's a little bit more experimental in its tone. Um, and that's what a lot of reviewers have like mentioned okay. about this one. Uh, but if you read The Midnight Library and you walked away feeling like you wanted to spend more time in The Midnight Library itself, walking through the stacks and taking in the atmosphere, I would give The Starless Sea a try. Um, next up... Uh, in a similar vein, but with more of a sci-fi twist to it, I have The Candy House by Jennifer Egan. So this book isn't out yet. It's scheduled to come out in April. Um, it's hard to say when it'll hit our shelves, probably sometime in April, but you can place a hold now if you're interested in what I'm about to say. So I got an advanced copy um, through the publisher uh, online. I sought it out just to sort of get a feel for the novel. Um, just so everybody, so we're clear and transparent. Um, so yeah, I've gone a little bit about halfway through, but The Candy House is a really interesting story. So it starts out with a technological innovation that changes society. It's 2010 and Bix Bhutan stumbles upon a new idea, a way to download and externalize your own memory, to access every memory and quote, own your unconscious. Users upload their memories, their unconscious experiences, to a computer into like a big database and it allows them to be viewed on a screen. The company calls this Own Your Unconscious and it finds a, multiple, a multitude of uses for it. So, so far in the story I've encountered things like a package called Whatever Happened to blank, um, which lets you upload your memory of a specific person. Um, that gets uploaded to a database and then they use facial recognition to search other uploads um, that people have made of their unconsciousness to find that person so you can then track them through other people's memories and find out what happened to them um, going as far back as like what they were like as a child sort of thing uh, and then there's another one that's mentioned called mandala memory shop so mandala is the parent company of own your own conscious and it lets you externalize something traumatic that happened to you recently and basically overwrite it in your memory. You upload it, it changes it, you re-upload it to your memory, and now it's like it never happened. Um, so obviously this gives you a lot of um, room for exploration of how something like this would impact society and human beings and everything like that. Um, it, the story really picks up after this technology has like taken a foothold in society. It's the new norm. And we see how it alters society itself through this large cast of characters that we sort of leapfrog through. So it stretches time and it also stretches like through this network of people that have somehow sort of loosely been built um, that you probably wouldn't even know if this technology didn't exist. So for example, um, one of the inspirations for Bix Bhutan's company in the first place is a book by this particular author, an ac academic book. Um, we pick up much later in the book with relatives of that character, and it's, Egan slowly, sort of slowly reveals that that's who we're talking about. 
and she just kind of builds a bunch of networks that way. So there's a lot of different characters. They all have this really distinct voice. Um, so if you like the sci-fi and character elements of the Midnight Library, you could give this one a try. I will say what we were talking about before with Matt Haig's writing style being so um, flowing and and not dragging. Um, Egan's, I wouldn't say it drags, but she does spend a lot more time um, with each of these characters in each of these places. So yeah, um, it's a little bit more experimental, not so much of an easy read, but it's still very much worth um, a try if those are the two elements you liked in uh, The Midnight Library. Well, that sounds like a really complex story, but it sounds really interesting, like really sci-fi, that if people really like sci-fi, like that would definitely be a good pick for them I think yeah so that's why I picked it was for that sci-fi element so I read the midnight library first and then I found a description of this book online and I thought it was going to be a little bit more of what um, Matt Haig does where it was like characters exploring moments from their past but it's really actually more about um, the future it's um, a really interesting like speculative fiction that way um, the other thing I really like about it is seeing a technology described more like we're used to nowadays where we have um, sort of like, like it's more described as like Facebook or Apple okay. would be. Um, I feel like when I think of evil sci-fi companies, it's like dark and glooming and like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and this one's very like, you get the feeling that they're have that like light minimalist branding so there's obviously a lot of parallels to recent societal changes that Egan is drawing on for sure, <laughs> for yeah, sure. I can definitely see that so yeah it's a really interesting book um comes out in April if you're into sci-fi uh definitely check it out and I've got one more for you before Jen gives her uh pick for the Midnight Library so those have covered some of the elements of the Midnight Library. When I read the Midnight Library itself, the book that I really thought um, it reminded me of was Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore by Robin Sloan. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this one because it's a little bit older and I feel like a lot of people have read it already. Um, but in terms of writing style, I really thought these two were similar. Um, so Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore. Clay Jannon is an out-of-work website designer when he decides to take a job working the night shift at Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookstore. While seemingly an ordinary bookstore most of the time, tucked away in the back is a collection of strange volumes Clay is forbidden to read, but is required to document any individual who requests to read them. Clay uses his high-tech skills and contacts to set out to solve the mystery of Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour, hour bookstore for himself. So it's not, not even really sci-fi or fantasy, um, but yeah, again, it, the tone reminded me the most of the Midnight Library. Um, it's got this like technological innovation quality to it that verges on sci-fi, but it's still very grounded in real life and what the technology was like in and around the time it was published. Um, it does have a lot of quirky characters. It doesn't let things drag like the Midnight Library. You keep moving on to the next event. Um, and if you really love that writing style, I would give this one a try. Um, it's sort of become a modern classic for people who love books and stories about books. So if you haven't read it, definitely go and seek it out. And those are my three picks for uh, the Midnight Library. And Jen, you have a pick for us as well. Yeah, I have one pick. So those are really excellent picks. They sound like really cool books, <laughs> especially the the 24-hour library. I might have to uh, get a copy of that one. Definitely. So the book that I chose, I only had one, but it's called Una Out of Order by Margarita Montemore. So we don't actually have a physical copy of this book. It is on Libby, on our Libby app, and you can get it as an ebook or an e audiobook. So, this book is basically it's about the, the character Una. So, it starts out with Una celebrating her 19th birthday on New Year's Eve in the year 1983. So, when New Year's hits, Una is transported 32 years into the future. She wakes up in the year 2015. She is now 51 years old. 
So Una's mom and personal assistant know about the time traveling. They warn her not to take pictures and not use social media. They do not want to tell her too much about her life. And they don't want to tell her what happened in the past. So she's living her life as a 51-year-old, and she's just really confused. She went from 1983 to 2015. She has to learn about social media, technology, cell phones, Ubers. And it's kind of, um, it's kind of fun how she's learning about this when she just came from the year 1983. It would be like culture shock. And the author was really good at um, explaining how Una was feeling. And Una is just like a really fun character. So then she is transported the next year. She's transported to the year 1991. She's 27. And this year she just decides to party and have fun and not really worry about the time traveling. And um, it just goes into a lot of detail about her friends and how different her life is. And then next she's transported to the year 2004 and she's 40 years old and married and this year just basically talks about her marriage and she still has a relationship with her mom and um, she still thinks about her past but she's trying to live in the now in the present and then the next leap she goes back a year to 2003 where she meets her husband and it just talks about like their life together I just don't want to give away too much um and then the next year, her leap goes to the year 1995. She's traveling a lot. She's in Vietnam. She goes to Cambodia. Like, she's in a different part of the world. She regularly calls her mom and stays in touch. And it just talks about, it just goes on about her life and how she's living it. And then the next year, she um, she's brought to the year 1999. She's 35. She's getting used to the leaping now. Um and this year she finds out who her personal assistant is because she has a tattoo with his initials on her arm. So this year is the year that she finds out who this person really is. And then the next um, leap brings her to the year 2017 and something really awful happens in this year. And she basically can't wait for it to be over so she can go back to another year so she can live her life again and remember what happened and or forget what just happened, I mean. Forget about the tragedy. And then her final leap brings her back to the year 1983. Before all this leaping happened. And now she gets to live her life. But she's already seen the future. So how could she live it differently? Would she make different choices? So that's how it's similar to the Midnight Library. Like, in Una... Una out of order. Like, she's just transported. She has no choice about where she's going. And she just wakes up and like she's in this new life. But um, at the end, she's back in 1983. So that's where it's similar to the Midnight Library where she can make different choices on what she's learned. Yeah. And it was just a really fun book. Like Una, her mom, her personal assistant, even the people in her life. They're just really fun characters. And the author really goes into a lot of detail with settings and characters the author is really good at explaining things and you kind of feel for Una because when she when she first gets transported like she's just really confused and she has no idea what's going on and she has no idea who these people are and she's living like the first the first time she was transported she went from like being a 19 year old to um how old was she 51 and she was really rich and like she was living in this mansion she had no clue how she got here she was the same person but she was older yeah so you kind of feel like the confusion in the character. But and that was my similar pick. Yeah. And if you have Libby, I definitely recommend that you read this book because it's just a lot of fun. It was a really quick read and it was really enjoyable. It's almost like the Midnight Library in reverse because she's like going forward in time. Yes. And Nora's going back. So that's a really. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That's a really cool concept. Cool. All right. So. Those were our picks for the Midnight Library. Um, yeah, hopefully out of those four, you'll get something um, really enjoyable. It's always interesting to see like what we come up with for a different or the same topic because you and I have be uh, very different reading styles, I would say. That's true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Definitely check out all those books. We'll have... A little footer pop up to tell you where to find them. Most of them you can find on shelf or on Libby. But I think that's going to do it for this episode. So 
Thanks for joining us, everyone. My name is Emma. And I'm Jen. And we'll see you again next month for a brand new episode of Booking It. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.